Let us open our Bibles once again to the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews in chapter 1. Let us go before the Lord in prayer before we have the reading this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we are here at this uh, crucial time where your word is going to be opened and proclaimed. And we know that as your word goes, so you go. That you have sent it and empowered it to bring about heavenly things in our lives. Father God, we would see your son today. Let us see Jesus. Let us be filled by his presence, his mind. Let us delight in you and be conformed unto his image. <clears throat> it is in his name that we pray. Amen <clears throat> and amen. How many of us, by way of introduction this morning, how many of us, perhaps, when you were a child, isn't childhood a time of great magic, isn't it? It's a time uh, of great uh, dreams, looking forward to the future, anticipation, right? Our minds are always seem to be filled with visions about the future. Um, <clears throat> and how many of us, as we were children, perhaps anticipated and dreamed of things about the future. Or perhaps somebody had made you promises, and it may be as simple as my father telling me, well, this summer we're going to go out to the beach. And that to me was uh, an amazing uh, place to go to and a great uh, adventure and something to look forward to. And how many of us, as we received those promises and things that we were going to do, anticipated, right? We're filled with anticipation of what that was going to be like, of what that would look like, with dreams about the experience that we would then uh, have uh, in the future. <clears throat> well, the portion of Scripture that we have been sharing, I believe it's <clears throat> God's way, <clears throat> of saying to the Hebrews, God provided Old Testament saints with anticipatory hopes and dreams in the midst of a situation after the fall that was filled with suffering, with pain, and with judgment. So when we read in Hebrews chapter 1, <clears throat> that God, verse 1, at various times and in various ways spoke in, times, in time past to the fathers by the prophets. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is God's way of saying to the Hebrews, the hopes and the dreams of your people, of the people of God in the past, were placed in the future. In someone. And who is that someone? Then we go on to read. This God who spoke in the past. Has in these last days. Spoken to us. By his son. The hopes and the dreams. And the anticipation. Was connected and directed to the person. The coming of the person of Christ. God would fill his people his Old Testament saints, with the delight of anticipation, with visions and dreams about the future and what it would bring in Christ Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews is telling to this community, if you abandon Christ, you are abandoning that which the Old Testament saints, that which the old figures 
that which events in the past, institutions of the past, the Word of God in the past pointed to and filled them with anticipation and with hope. In Christ Jesus, we have come to the reality and the fulfillment of those dreams and hopes. In that light then, as you have heard me now say, everything in the Old Testament, the major figures, major characters, the practices of Old Testament folks and saints, institutions that God established, were God's way of providing anticipatory hope about the future. In a moment in life where the human race appeared to be lost, they had lost God, they had lost God's world, they had lost fellowship with one another, and God comes and fills them with hope after their failure, the loss that they have experienced. We have seen then about a God that in the past provided hope through promise. He provided hope through promise. And that promise was now fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Now this promise that God gave from the beginning provided something very important for the race. It provided two things. Number one, the diagnosis of a fallen race. One of the things that we see in the Old Testament and in the words that God spoke in the past is that God is constantly, through the promise, diagnosing His people. Showing to the people their condition, their fallen condition. There is, as one of my professors in seminary would say, a fallen condition focus in the Word of God. Every time we look at this Word, we see the need of humanity. Every time we look at this Word, this Word interprets us because it shows us as needy people, as a needy race, as a race in need of intervention from outside. They cannot help themselves. They are in such a situation that it seems like the end of the rope. That it seems like the end of it all. It seems like there would be reason to be hopeless. Yet God, in the midst of that hopelessness, that despair and that darkness, pursues the race, pursues men with hope through His promise. The promise then provided the diagnosis of a fallen race as well as the cure, namely, righteousness and mercy. The world needed both. The world was in need of righteousness and mercy. If the world was going to be redeemed, the world was going to be redeemed through righteousness and mercy. That's why we hear in in a beautiful psalm, it's Psalm 85, where we hear that righteousness or justice and peace or mercy have kissed, have embraced. And that is a poetic language in the Psalms to point to the promise of what would happen in the person, in the life and in the work of Christ Jesus. What we need, which is righteousness before a holy and righteous God that created us, God was going to provide through Christ. What we need, which was mercy and grace, because we couldn't work the righteousness that was required before God, God would provide through a covenant of grace through which He would be merciful to us. As the book of Hebrews advances, we hear this theme of righteousness and mercy, of justice, of being conformed, conformity to God's righteousness. 
purification, cleansing that would come to the race through faith, through a better covenant. And the Hebrews were in great danger of going back to hopes and promises that if devoid of its fulfillment in Christ, would then be hopes and dreams that would be futile and useless. That's why then the writer of Hebrews points right from the start to fulfillment in Christ Jesus and goes on to say the following, as we have heard already, that God has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, verse 3, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. If we now skip on to chapter 2, we hear the following beginning in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Verse 10 again, For it was fitting for Him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. One of the things that we see then in this substitute, in this champion that God has prepared to bring righteousness and mercy to the human race is a combination of themes that appear to be paradoxical. We hear that Jesus suffered, that Jesus tasted death, that Jesus was humbled, and then right out of that, we hear Jesus resurrected, glorified, and exalted. We begin to hear and see through the Old Testament dreams and anticipatory signs of of these themes of humility and exaltation. Themes such as justice and mercy or mercy through justice. Themes themes of judgment and grace, or grace through judgment. We hear the themes of blood and cleansing, or cleansing through blood. Death and resurrection is another theme that we're going to continually hear in the old past words that God spoke anticipating the future. Death and resurrection, or resurrection through death. We hear a theme of barrenness and fruitfulness. We're going to, we're going to, begin, we're going to come now to the story of uh, Abraham and Sarah. And uh, we by now have already been acquainted with this, the theme of infertility, barrenness. And yet out of barrenness or through barrenness, fruitfulness. We hear the theme of curse and blessing. It's all throughout the Old Testament, which will become then blessing through curse. We're going to hear the theme of exile and hope, which will then become hope through exile. We're going to hear the theme of pilgrimage and community, which will then turn into community through pilgrimage. We're going to, we're going to hear of trial and the longing for peace, which will then turn into peace through trial. We're going to hear a burden, a burden, and a longing and a need for rest, which will turn then into rest through burden. Last Sunday, we saw 
and we begin to discern some of these themes that have to do with what appear to be paradoxical concepts such as justice and mercy. And the Bible wants to say these two paradoxical, seemingly paradoxical concepts embrace, come together in the person and the work of Christ. If we fail to see that, we are going to always be undermining an aspect of our salvation. In other words, if we say the Bible, it's all about justice and righteousness. We need to be a people of righteousness. We need to be a people of obeying the commandments of God or bringing justice in the world. If we fail to see that God is about bringing justice through mercy and through grace, then we will just become activists in the world seeking to engage in transformation and change, which is not necessarily bad, right, with uh, the, the appropriate focus, but it's not the message of the gospel. If we then, on the other hand, go to the other side and say, well, Christianity, it's all about grace and mercy. And it's about just God receiving us and accepting us. But we do not highlight that God is up to and about bringing justice and righteousness through that grace. Then our grace and our mercy becomes an empty shell. A vacuous, meaningless concept in, in our lives and in the world. God is about both. He is about righteousness and He is about mercy. He is about justice and He is about grace. He is about transforming, about renewing, and He is about forgiveness. He will accomplish the work that He set out to do in order to correct His damaged world tainted by sin. And He is about to do it through grace and through mercy. So every time we look back to those figures, to those events, to those first words that God spoke, you're going to be seeing the ramifications of these themes in them. God is bringing diagnosis and at the same time cure. God is going to be speaking of the world needs righteousness. The world has been robbed of righteousness, of justice, but by the same token that God is hitting that theme and saying, this is what is necessary. This is what's required. That's the kind of world that I'm going to create. That's a new creation that I have set out to do. Then God says, and this is going to come to you and do the world through grace and through mercy by the person and the work of Jesus Christ, whom I am going to perfect, to establish whom I am going to put forth as the worker of righteousness through suffering so that we may inherit out of the abundance of His righteousness and out of the work of His suffering unto us. So we saw that with Noah last Sunday. If we uh, go to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we read the following about Noah so that we can then connect on to another figure from the past, which is Abraham. We read about Noah in verse 7 of chapter 11. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepare an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. The writer of Hebrews says that Noah was an heir of righteousness. See, here's the theme of what God is about. 
He is about righteousness. He's a God of righteousness, a God of holiness, who is going to restore the world to a righteousness and a holiness that is found in Christ Jesus. But now he tells us in this verse that Noah was an example of a righteousness that came to him according or through or by faith. Noah believed in the promise. Noah believed the diagnosis that God gave him. Noah, you are sinful and you need cleansing. Noah, you need consecration by me. Noah, you need to be set apart for my purposes of righteousness and holiness, Noah. But Noah, you are guilty. You stand in the same relationship in Adam as the rest of this world. But if you trust me, if you believe in me, Noah, if you believe in the promise that I have given, that through a substitute, I am going to put you in a position of righteousness, Noah, I am going to save you. Then, Noah, I am going to put you as an example of righteousness through faith. Or, Another language expression of the Bible uses is the righteousness of faith. It's not a righteousness that we can stand in ourselves before God because we know that in ourselves we fall short. But it's a righteousness that God gives and grants by imputation. It's a righteousness that God pronounces upon us and holds us and accounts us as righteous. And because of the righteousness of another, then He places us in that position of being righteous, of salvation, of being consecrated, of being cleansed, of being set aside so that we may serve Him. We heard in Peter, the Apostle Peter gives through the Holy Spirit, an interpretation of the events of the flood. And we read there in verse 20, the following of 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we, we heard the following, speaking about Christ, by whom also He went and preached to the spirits in prison. What this means is that the promise about Christ was there during the time of Noah. The preaching of the gospel, looking forward and in, in an anticipatory way to Christ, was there during the time of Noah where the race was in bondage. Where the spirits of the people of the time were in prison. And the message of the gospel, the message of Christ, the spirit of Christ, through the proclamation of His gospel, through Noah, was there. And notice what happens. It says, By whom also He went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, a souls, were saved through water. A souls were saved through water. The waters of the flood, which meant judgment and death for the rest of humanity, became the cleansing waters through which Noah and his family were saved. So you notice then that, as, as it says here, it was through water, through flood, through judgment, that Noah and his family were saved. God does not spare the judgment. He certainly will bring judgment because judgment signifies that His righteousness must be upheld. But it is through judgment that God saves. And notice what the author of this epistle, Peter, goes on to say and compare the flood with and this event of salvation. Verse 21, there is also an antitype. Antitype meaning the reality of a sign that has been given before. So there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. 
Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to Him. The drowning waters of judgment. Because that's what the flood was. It was waters in which a whole generation was drowned. Also became the cleansing waters of baptism. The cleansing waters of righteousness for Noah and his family. In other words, the writer of First, First Peter, Peter says that this baptism through judgment becomes now the possibility for Noah and his family to have a clean conscience before God. A clear, a restful, a tranquil conscience. One of the themes that we're going to see in Hebrews is the theme of rest. We're going to hear of burdens. And we're also going to hear of rest. We're going to hear of labors, of works. And then we're going to hear of rest. Noah and his family, when they were in that ark, in the midst of the drowning waters, couldn't help but bring to mind, we should have drowned, but we are not drowning. This ark, this ship, has become the sacred safe place where God has shown mercy and grace to us. The waters that should have drowned them, the ark that should have been the tomb, the death of them all, has become the place of meeting, the place of safety, the place of encounter with God, the place of grace. So it is through judgment and out of judgment that the mercy and the grace of God encounters Noah and his family. And this gives him a conscience that God will not strike out against us in wrath. Because he has already done so. He has already, Noah could have thought, and, and we hear then, as Noah hears of the covenant that God makes with him. You remember God goes on to put his rainbow on the sky, the form of a bow. And God says, I will no longer destroy the earth because of the disobedience of man in this fashion. I will no longer strike out like this. In other words, I will not wipe out humanity because I have given a promise. I am going to let my promise stand. I am going to let the promise of mercy stand and run its way. I am going to save a generation out of judgment. I'm going to save a generation out of the fires, the cleansing fires of judgment. Baptism then becomes a symbol of that drowning. Becomes a symbol then of cleansing through fire. We know that ultimately, another one of the themes in the Word of God is that cleansing comes through fire. Another uh, theme of the Word of God is how the fire of God's judgment will be revealed. All of these themes in the Old Testament were God's way of anticipating the person and the work of Christ. Noah and his family were saved in the midst of the drowning waters. Through baptism, they acquire a conscience now that God will not strike against me because He could have done so. In this time of judgment, God rightfully, because of my lack of righteousness, could have lashed out against me, could have wiped me out with the rest, but He hasn't done so. He has forgiven me. He has acted in grace and mercy toward me. And Noah then acquires the conscience of one that can stand in boldness and confidence before God. One that now wants to serve the Lord as somebody that's been spared and saved by Him to inherit 
a new lease on creation. So this is what the, the writer of Hebrews is making reference to. In this chapter 12, he is highlighting faith, the righteousness of faith. We have said that if we are not careful, we immediately go to the works and to the things that these folks did in the world. But that carries a significance only insofar as their works, their manifestation of righteousness in the world has come because they have acquired through faith the conscience of one that has been sanctified by God, by the Word of God that has called them, set aside, holy, my inheritance, my people through faith. That's what God is out to do now. He wants to demonstrate to the Hebrews that that's what He did through Christ and that the Old Testament, the cultic practices of the Old Testament had to do with highlighting precisely this work of righteousness and mercy through Christ. And then we come to another word uh, from the past, which is a word given to Abraham which we come to know as the father of faith. Now God, after He has brought the flood and He has announced and spoken about grace in the midst of judgment, now He's going to say to the world, I am putting together a people. I am going to give you now in this world anticipation, something you can get your hands on about what I am preparing to do. How does he do it then? He begins to do it with the story of Abraham. If we go back in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, we hear the following. In Genesis chapter 12, <clears throat> now the Lord has said, beginning in verse 1, now the Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless, bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord has spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So we come then to the narrative of the story of redemption. These are stories that the Hebrews, the community that the writer of Hebrews is addressing, would have in their minds, keeping in mind that their temptation is to sever, is to cut off these themes and persons and figures of the Old Testament from fulfillment in Christ, we come back then to them to see them in the light of Christ. To see them in the light of what God was preparing to do in Christ. And what is it that God has been up to? If you remember from Adam, God's ambition, God's desire, God's will was to dwell with men. One of the things that we hear from uh, the book of Genesis at the very beginning is that God walked with man. That also means that man walked with God. And in the context of a place, of a land, where God and man could walk together, there was to be much fellowship because man was not alone. There was going to be woman with him. There was going to be a family that would be God's family, united with God, walking with God, and walking with one another in a world where that was possible. In a world that should be the hopes, the aspirations, and the dreams of the human race if they knew who God was. We as Christians, we as people of faith, we now that have come to know God, those aspirations and those dreams are placed right back in our hearts. What is our aspiration? What is our dream? To have our best life now? 
to get a career and an education and be very successful in this world? Not so. That is not, those are not the dreams and aspirations of God's people. That is part of how God uses us in this world, but the ultimate goal and purpose of God's people is to walk with God, to look forward to a place where God dwells in our midst. For God to walk with us, for Him to walk with Him, to be in a place where that is possible because righteousness dwells there. See? The righteous God inhabits a place that is sacred, that is righteous, and that is holy. He cannot do otherwise. And the righteous and holy God walks with people that are righteous, that are holy, that are sacred and consecrated to Him. In a place of such character that that may be possible. That it may be possible for God to walk with the human family that He has created for Himself. For them to delight in Him. And for God to delight over them. And as a result of that relationship, as a result of that blessedness, another word that we could use for it, which obviously carries a lot of different tones in our our society, is happiness. That out of the happiness, the blessedness of relationship and walking with God, then the place would be a very special place. Because of the happiness, the blessedness of God dwelling in our midst. So God wants to fill His people with anticipations of what He is preparing to do. With dreams, with forebodings, with visions, with looks to the future about what God is preparing to do for man and with man. And the story of the Old Testament then becomes those pictures, those images, those dreams, those types that would have then an ultimate reality in the person and the work of Christ and all that God would bring about through Him. So every time we look to the past, We must position those past figures, events, institution, and practices looking to the future. We must be talking about dreams and visions and promises about the future through the person and the work of Christ who would make that possible. Because all of this could only be worked out by God Himself. Not by Adam. Adam would not be the heir of such a world, of such blessedness. He could not work it out. God put him in such a position at the beginning and said, if you obey, these things will unfold. But Adam, through righteousness alone, could not hold. Right? You see? He could not make, through his righteousness that world firm and stable for him and for his posterity. But God has not given up on the idea. He has not given up on his grand design. Praise be to God that he has not given up on that because from the moment that we are born, even though we don't know it and even though we're in darkness and even though we're accursed and separated from God, these aspirations and longings for a better place, for fellowship, for meaning, for something greater is wired in our persons, is it not? The aspirations of humanity um, have to do with a spirituality that they cannot discern. Have to do with a God that they have lost sight of. Have to do with a plan that they do not know. But they are there. In their hearts. And God is going now to give birth to them through the promises given 
in the past through his redemptive and narrative story in the past that is always pointing to the reality in Christ Jesus. If you notice, we're going to take our time here with Abram for a couple of Sundays. But if you notice, when Abram gets called, he gets called to leave his country. What is that theme about? It's a theme of exile, in a way. It's a theme of leave your place. Go out from your place. There is a better place. (laughs) Go out in a pilgrimage. Oh, wow, but you would say, but pilgrimage and exile and migration. How many of us here know about immigration? About exile? About pilgrimage? Yes. There's a reason why God said, remember the foreigner in your midst. Because you were foreigners. From the moment that we lost paradise, we're all immigrants. And we're all in exile. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They lost their place. Did they not? The gates of paradise, the special place and habitation that they had delighted in, out of their own fault and their own disobedience, they lost. And as much as they tried to build another place like it, they could not succeed. And we see it in the Old Testament. The efforts of men are building a new city. We begin to hear of the great men of old and their great heroic deeds such as Nimrod. These were city folks. These were people that were trying to organize society again and said, we are going to be great. We're going to make a name for ourselves. These are people that said, we are going to build a society again where we can boast and glory and rest and advance and develop. Yet, it was all doomed to failure. It was all doomed to futility. There was a need for exile and for pilgrimage. And there would be, astoundingly, community and rest and land through exile, and through pilgrimage. It's not very different from the Son of God that was called to leave His heavenly abode and come to a foreign land. A foreign land that was not the place that the Father had intended for us to have, was it? But yet the Son was sent there. And He was sent there to redeem. And He redeemed through the pilgrimage that he endured and suffered in this world. You begin to see how the story of Abraham and the figures and events of the past are nothing but great pointers and anticipatory visions, so to speak, and dreams about the hopes and aspirations that God had given in the promise. We'll finish with this. We'll come back to Hebrews chapter 12. And we hear what the writer of Hebrews says then about this other figure, Abraham, Abraham now as he came to be called. And we hear the following. In Hebrews chapter 11, then we hear verse 8 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham obeyed. When he was called to go to a place to go out, when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, for he waited for the city. <laughs> which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You see then this theme of exile, of leaving your country, of leaving your place. Abraham was looking for a place that God called him to. A place that we have lost. A place that is the only place where the human race will be content and satisfied at peace, in community, 
and at rest. But it's a place that would not be found on this earth. It's a place that would begin to take shape and reality through the cross. At the altar, at the place of sacrifice, at the place of judgment, at the place of drowning, of death. It was through that drowning, through that death, through that burial, through that place of judgment and the fiery judgment of the righteousness of God out of which the hope of new creation would emerge. The hope of a new place. The vision, the dream, the longing for a reality that they had been waiting for. And that now we have the assurance of in the person and the work of Christ for us. Isn't that reason for us to rejoice? To go out not differently from the times of Noah and Abraham. To a place of darkness, certainly. To a place of suffering. To a place where pain and death abounds. But yet go out in hope. But yet go out in faith. But yet go out in obedience because we have great promises and a great future to anticipate and look forward to. Church, is that the way that we're living our lives? Are those the dreams and the visions that animate our Christian living? I hope they will be. And I pray that more and more it will be so as we continue to unveil and unfold the person and the work of Christ for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to be in your house and to be led through your word to Christ. Father, we pray that through beholding your glory in Christ, you may transform us daily through the vision and the hope of promises fulfilled in him that await its final manifestation in a time yet to come. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for your it is finished at the cross. And we thank you for resurrecting through Christ the aspirations and the longings of humanity to be with God and for God to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, Amen.